we, we reiterate that um, the, there is just no basis for um, uh, some of the leaders of countries which have imposed uh, these restrictions on traveling for, uh, uh, for, for us in South Africa and other countries in Southern Africa. There is no basis for South Africans to panic. We've been here before. Uh, this is no new uh, territory. We, have, we are now more than 20 months experience in terms of uh, the COVID-19, the various variants, uh, the various waves. And, and we want to again thank our scientists, uh, Prof. Tulio, De Oliveira, and, and, and the team also with uh, Professor Karim and, and NICD and, and all our, our team, which is here. It's often said, you are better off uh, dealing with an enemy you know than an enemy you don't know. So uh, you can imagine if we're just seeing infections rising, we didn't know what was it about, what was the cause. And thanks for their diligent work. We now know that it is driven by a variant, um, and, but also uh, thanks to the WHO for giving it a name. We will not only just say there is a variant with this number, we now know its name is Om Omicron, uh, thanks to the WHO. Um, now, our, our medical scientists, our epidemiologists, our clinicians are, re, are working daily, hourly, uh, studying th this virus, its characteristics, and its impact on, on, on us as, uh, as human beings, as, as, as citizens. Um, uh, among the things which the president outlined yesterday that we still have to uh, 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 understand, led by our scientists, such as the transmissibility of this virus, uh, those that's a, a matter which our scientists and epidemiologists are working on, whether there is any age differentiation in terms of uh, uh, its uh, transmissibility and, 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 and illness, whether there is uh, increased reinfection uh, for those who had already been infected before, and including also breakthrough infections for those who are the, for those of us who are uh, already vaccinated, and also to to the extent to which the vaccines remain of, of, of serious protection. All these matters, as the, which are the, what the president outlined as work in progress, we can be rest assured that in a matter of days and weeks, our, our scientists will have actually gone to the bottom of this. But in the meantime, we are doing everything possible to make sure that our health facilities are ready. Um, we know that as the infections rise, uh, people will get sick, some will get severe, especially those who have not been vaccinated. Uh, but we know that there will also be incidences where even those who are vaccinated may get uh, uh, ill and uh, the health facilities should be ready. And that's why uh, we have a Gauteng representative here just to shed light and, uh, and as the epicenter currently of this uh, variant to give us a sense of the readiness of the health facilities. Now, under the leadership of uh, President Ramaphosa, we're also engaging leaders of various countries, uh, especially those who have initiated these travel bans, to convince them that indeed this is very unnecessary. Um, and in, 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 say, in doing this, we are happy that we are supported by the World Health Organization. Just yesterday afternoon at, uh, at about six in the, in the, in the evening, uh, I had an engagement on the request of the U.S. Secretary for Health and Human Services, Mr. Javier Becerra, who was accompanied by a high-level team, including the head of the CDC of, of, of the USA. And Mr. Becerra expressed his appreciation of our medical scientists and, and also appreciation of the stance of South Africa in terms of making sure that as early as we could, as soon as we knew that there was this variant had been identified, we we're ready to share the information uh, with the world. And he pledged uh, support uh, um, in his capacity as the Secretary for Health and Human Services for the, for the US. But uh, in my response, I said to him that while we appreciate the support, we know that we've come a long way with the Americans. They are supporting us in the fight against HIV and AIDS through the PEPFA, we, got, we get quite a good financial support from them. And also the contribution they've made in donating just over six, uh, 7 million uh, uh, Pfizer vac vaccine doses. But we, I said to him that uh, 
while we appreciate that and also his expression of uh, support for our, uh, uh, our stance in sharing the information, the, the action of his government doesn't, doesn't say that to our people, to us as South Africans and to our people. And so my message to him when he asked, what is it which they can do to support us? I said, what you can do is to say to your uh, president and your government that the travel bans are not helping us. They're just making things more difficult. And it's in contradiction to what you are saying that as, 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 as the, uh, the American government, you are actually in support of the, the approach which we have taken. So, so that is the message which we gave uh, Minister of uh, uh, Derko, Minister Pando and, and various ministers and the president are also engaging leaders of various countries in, in, in Europe and, and the Americas. Now, um, the WHO Afro, the, direct, the regional director, Dr. Mweti also uh, sent us a statement which uh, they have issued as WHO which also condemns the travel bans and warns um, all these countries that uh, this is counterproductive. That while we're calling for openness and sharing of information by doing what they've done, they're actually being counterproductive. So we welcome uh, that uh, statement. And later today, the World Health Assembly is convening. Um, it's starting actually, uh, it just started now at 10 o'clock. Uh, so we'll be joining the World Health Assembly, a special World Health Assembly which is dealing with uh, strengthening the, our, the world response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, later in the afternoon, uh, we will be presenting a statement on behalf of Southern African countries uh, to condemn the action of those who have imposed travel bans. So this is also mobilizing other countries on the world platform uh, to express our, our outrage at, at the travel bans. Now, as I conclude, I want to just say again to reiterate the call made by the president last night that our best you know, response to this will be if more South Africans uh, come forward to take the vaccine. This is the only way, this is the best weapon over and above the non-pharmaceutical interventions, the best weapon in our hands to make sure that we can you know, fight back uh, this uh, uh, variants and, and, and the, the pandemic as a whole. Thank you very much. Uh, let me invite uh, Prof. Uh, Abdul Karim uh, to take the floor on behalf of the scientists. Uh, uh, in, with your permission, uh, Mr. Foster Mughali, uh, can I invite uh, Prof. Abdul Karim? Uh, I know he's, uh, a bit of, he's got a bit of pressure of time. Over to you, uh, Prof. Thank you very much, Minister. It's a great pleasure and honor to be here. What I would like to do very quickly in the next 10 minutes is just to give you a very quick overview of uh, what we know and what we don't know as we deal with this uh, situation. So let me see if I can get this task bar. I can't seem to get it to be full. Ah, uh, there we are. No, sorry. Uh, okay. Oops, sorry. That's not the right thing. I'm trying to get to show taskbar. Uh, okay, no, I couldn't get it to be full here for some reason. Uh, hide presenter view. Uh, there we are, done. Okay. Thank you very much, Minister. It's uh, an honor for me to be here with you today. I'm going to very quickly go through what we do and what we don't know about the Omicron variant and how is that guiding us in the way in which we are responding. Uh, I'm sorry I can't stay with you for the entire session because I'm speaking in a World AIDS Day event shortly, but let's quickly go through it. Firstly, if we look at the global situation, we can see at a global level, the world has been through a first wave, second wave, third wave, and the numbers are now steadily increasing across several continents now. And so we may be at a global level entering a fourth wave. And we know that the variants have changed the COVID-19 endgame. We know that the variants have now led to a situation where we cannot simply hope that we can use public health measures and vaccines on their 
own, we've got to be, sorry, vaccines on their own, we've got to be looking at dealing with the variants as new ones arise. And so in changing that, our main concern, and why are we concerned about variants, is because of what we've seen in other countries and indeed in our own country. Here, I'm presenting here the first waves in India, Brazil, and South Africa. If you look at all three of those first waves, you get some idea of what we were dealing with back in the first half of last year. But look at what has what happened since. The Delta variant drove a severe wave in India. And I think we all saw the heart-wrenching pictures on our TV screens. We saw how the Gamma variant drove the epidemic in much of Southern, Af uh, Southern America. And in our own country, we saw how the beta variant drove our second wave and the delta variant drove our third wave. And so we have some idea of the challenges we grapple with in dealing with each new variant. And if we look at the epidemic and the state of our current epidemic in South Africa, what we are seeing now is a rapid rise in cases. And I think all of us have been quite amazed at how fast the numbers are going up, given that we were in low transmission until barely a week ago. And when we look at this increase, we would have to understand what's driving that increase. And it's due to the excellent research that has been done that has identified what is potentially a major source of driving this new increase in cases. But let me just make this very clear. We were not caught with our pants down. We expected and prepared for a new variant and a fourth wave. As far back as September at the Mosineke Commission, I basically outlined what I anticipated would be the, the trajectory of the pandemic, just based on you know, what we've known about the first three waves. And if we look at that situation, what, what did we do? Well, government invested together with many other agencies in building the capacity to do genomic sequencing in Africa and particularly in South Africa. And so in South Africa, that investment has now paid dividends through this broad national consortium led by Professor Dolivera and the NICD. And what we have seen is that they have delivered. They have given us the best fighting chance by giving us evidence early that we're dealing with a new variant. Now, so we've been expecting this and we anticipated it would come. We didn't know exactly when it would come, what it would look like, but we had some ideas and some predictions about what was the likely scenarios. So when we look at this particular new variant, we can we don't know much about it itself. So we don't really know how it behaves. We don't know how it is, uh, you know, how transmissible and so on. Those estimations will come with time. But what we can do is we can extrapolate based on the mutations we are seeing. And so we can, we can, we can get some idea of what's the likely scenarios and we can plan and we can prepare and respond based on those likely scenarios. And if you look at the likely scenarios, well, there are a whole range of mutations that we know well. We know them well because they are already in the alpha, beta, gamma, and delta variants, and we know what they do. We know that, for example, uh, a set of the mutations and deletions that occur are responsible for changing the way one particular PCR test responds. And so it becomes a marker that helps us identify it. We know that uh, some of the mutations we see in this particular variant are also in the Delta variant near the furin cleavage site. And so they enhance transmissibility. So we can expect this new variant will have enhanced transmissibility. We know that this uh, variant has some mutations similar to the beta and gamma variants that are uh, responsible for some level of immune escape. So we will expect that there'll be at least some partial escape from antibodies. So we, we can predict this or put it together a scenario based on what we are seeing in the mutations. But there are some mutations in this particular variant that we have just only slight information about. We don't really know fully well what they do, but we have some inkling. 
And then there are a whole lot of mutations. We have no idea what they do. And so a lot about this variant, we simply don't know because this is a constellation. It's not about only the individual mutations, but what can we reasonably expect from this particular variant and how will it impact the key elements of our response? So let's look at that. Let's look at, are our current diagnostics going to be effective? Well, it's picked up on at least two of the three genes in the Thermo Fisher kit. So we expect that it would do quite well. Our diagnostics should function well. We've got no reason to be concerned, hence the smiley face. In terms of clinical presentation, there's not enough data yet. We've seen some anecdotal information. We've seen you know, clinicians commenting, but you have to understand that patients coming into a clinical setting are biased in terms of their severity and what we are seeing. What we are seeing is anecdotal information suggests similar presenting illnesses, mainly in younger people for obvious reasons, and that younger people are less vaccinated. So you will see more cases there. But we simply do not have, you know, sound, reliable data on the clinical presentation. But we have no red flags that have been raised so far. So we can't be complacent. We need to monitor the situation. We don't know where we stand, so no smiley face. But we're monitoring that. And we should have more information on this, and some of which you will hear in the course of this present, in the course of this briefing. The third is our current treatment still effective? Yes, smiley face, because we know that most of the things we use in our standard treatment protocols should be effective. There's one area that's not clear, and that's on monoclonal antibodies, and that remains to be tested. We don't really widely use them in South Africa, so they don't really impact on us. Uh, there's you know, new potential treatments coming into play, like Paxlovid. I won't go into that because that's you know, more complicated to, to share with you. And I'll, I can always cover that in, in, in later time. So as far as diagnostics, clinical presentation, current treatments, we've got really no reason for concern. What about our public health interventions? Our public health interventions all work. Social distancing, ventilation, all the usual things, they work. The area that has created the concern and this global overreaction is that we're not sure about whether the current vaccines will protect against this new variant. And there's some evidence, preliminary as it is, that we can see that the mutations that occur may confer some level of immune escape from antibodies. And so we can expect that we may see uh, more reinfection. So those who've had natural infection without being vaccinated, we may see them getting infected again because this variant will bypass some of that immunity. We may see that uh, in terms of the antibodies generated by the J&J Pfizer uh, vaccines, we don't know how that will respond. It's left to be seen. We'll know definitively in probably take us a good two, three, maybe enough to four weeks to get those answers. But based on what we know, and based on how the other variants of concern have reacted to vaccine immunity, we can expect that we will still see high effectiveness for hospitalization and severe disease. And that that protection of the vaccines is likely to remain strong. Now, I don't know this definitively, the studies are being done, but based on what we know, we can expect that this is the likely scenario, that the vaccines should hold well in terms of preventing hospitalization, severe disease, because they depend more on T cell immunity and less on antibodies. So even if there's some escape from antibodies, it's very hard to escape T cell immunity. So that's the likely scenario that we are uh, to see, I'm expecting. Now, more Omicron is expected to have an increased risk of immune escape, and we may impact on the clinical efficacy of vaccines, but we used to, we know this. We've studied this here in South Africa, we've studied it globally. AstraZeneca, for example, that was highly effective at 70% against the D614G variant, was only 10% effective against the beta, but it was 60% effective against Delta. So we understand that different vaccines might react differently, have different levels of protection against 
particularly mild infections. And so we've seen that with the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, you know, 91 to 95% protection against D614G. And, you know, pretty high infections, we have protection against the beta variant, as we know from the study of the original Pfizer trial that included South Africa. But against Delta, we started seeing lower levels of protection from the Pfizer vaccine. Still pretty good, but slightly lower than what we were seeing previously. So this is not unexpected. We know how to assess this and we'll know how to adjust our strategies accordingly. What we do know, and this comes from many different studies, and I'm sharing with you just some of them. This is a study of 230,000 people in Qatar, 3.4 million people in California, 8.8 .8 million people in New York State, and the whole population of Israel. What we're seeing is that even over time, the protection of the vaccines against the different variants, including Delta, has remained pretty good, usually above 90%. And it doesn't matter which vaccine we're talking about, they tend to do quite well in protecting against severe disease. Because that's our big concern with this disease. We do not want to end up in a situation where our hospitals are overwhelmed with clinical illness and patients with severe disease. So our vaccines will provide us with some protection. So Omicron was first described in Botswana and then shortly thereafter in South Africa. And the fact that it was so early uh, in its description and picked up is a scientific success. It's, an, it's a success of the investment that our country has made in science. South Africa and the world now needs to convert that scientific success to a response success. And as you already heard, the last thing we need is panic and overreaction. And certainly what we've seen in knee-jerk reactions is really uncalled for. And we've dealt with variants before. It's not new. Our country has there. We've been among the first to describe variants before. So we know how to do this, including how to deal with variants with immune escape. Closing the borders has almost no benefit. Well, no benefit for two reasons. As of yesterday, there are already 11 countries reporting cases of Omicron. So, you know, uh, trying to isolate South Africa or even Southern Africa is not really going to help because pretty soon many other countries are going to become uh, avenues of spread of the virus. But more importantly, we have existing five-step strategy that actually does very well in reducing travel transmission risk. We already know how to prevent and reduce the risk through travel. And that's by ensuring that only vaccinated people travel, you do symptom screening at boarding, you ensure they have a negative PCR result at boarding, you have a mask during the flight. And lastly, you know, as I've just seen, having gone to France for the meeting at the Pasteur Institute, you get a COVID test on arrival. That is the way in which we can protect ourselves. You can add in you know, additional requirements like quarantine, self or mandated, but we can deal with this. They, just at a time when we have a new threat in this pandemic, when we should be standing together against the virus, we end up you know, standing against each other. We end up putting fences between us instead of you know, dealing with this and understanding what the enemy is and how that we need to tackle it together. So there are three things that, you know, I believe need to be done to deal with this virus. And our response needs to focus on that. The first is we can expect that higher transmissibility is likely. And so we're going to get more cases quickly. We're already seeing early evidence of this. And if that happens, the cases uh, concern, I'm expecting we'll top over 10,000 cases by the end of the week per day. We'll see pressure on hospitals within the next two to three weeks. And even if Omicron is not clinically worse, and the, certainly the anecdotes don't raise any red flags just yet, but we don't know for sure, we are going to see this in all likelihood because of the rapidity of transmission. In a, in a way that in which, which we saw with the Delta variant, a very rapid rise in cases and huge pressure on the hospitals in Fountain. Our public health measures work, so let's use them. Mask wearing, you know, ensuring that we follow all the rules. I won't go through them right now, but you know, things we know very well. And then finally, our biggest challenge is going to be to prevent super spreading events that will just put us out of control and to ensure 
that we reduce the risk of transmission, particularly indoors. And to do that, you know, even though we're likely to see more reinfections and breakthrough infections, the vaccinated people will have less, they are less likely to have severe COVID. And so one of the things is to restrict risky situations, particularly indoors, to vaccinated only people. And that's part of the strategy and the direction in which we should be heading. On that note, Minister, thank you very much. Uh, I'm uh, sorry I have to leave you, but I hope that was helpful. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Prof. Uh, I'm sure you leave us with a very capable team, uh, which, which will take us through uh, further and, and answer the questions. Um, and uh, keep your phone on, 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 on silent. Uh, if we get stuck with some difficult question, we'll WhatsApp you and, <laughs> and you can, but I'm sure we've got a very capable team here, which can deal with those. But this is not the end, as we say, this is a this is a marathon. It's not a sprint. So uh, as we go through this marathon, uh, we will always uh, tap on your knowledge and experience. Thank you very much. Uh, back to you, uh, Foster. Thanks, uh, Minister, and thanks uh, to Dr. Karim for that uh, comprehensive uh, presentation. Without wasting any time, I'm going to call up. We're going to get a presentation on epidemiological update as far as the. Uh, this uh, variant is concerned. I believe uh, Ms. Uh, Dr. Michelle Groom is going to give us that uh, uh, update. Over to you, Dr. Michelle. Yes, sure. Thanks. Um, just trying to share my screen. Uh, right. Can you share, uh, see my screen faster? Yeah, we can see the screen, Michelle. Can see. Just Thank put you. It on oh, yeah, I'll put on this. Yes. There we go. Thank you. Is it fine now? Yeah, I can just put it. Oh, yeah, no, it's fine. Okay, One of great. Good morning, Honourable Minister and, and colleagues and viewers. Um, so I'm just going to give you a brief update, I think, just in terms of where we are in um, the epidemiology. Um, so this is really just a, 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 um, our lab confirmed cases. And you can see we'd actually, you know, towards the middle of November, um, had the lowest case numbers that we had seen really at any point since we had started um, the pandemic. Um, with a, we, we talk about the seven day moving average, um, which is really just to even out the number of cases that we see on a daily basis. We know that often over the weekends um, that we see slightly lower cases. And so the seven day moving average gives us a good indication of this. And so in mid November, this was less than 300. And you can see that we have seen a rather rapid increase in terms of the number of new cases. We were sitting at the seven day moving average of just under 2000 at the moment. Um, we also have a look at these are the number of tests in the bars. So you can see that the testing that we were doing during this this period after the wave, very similar to what we were doing um, between the second and third wave. And the one metric which we really use is the percent positivity, which is the number of new cases each day out of the total number of cases um, of tests that were done. And you can see our positivity rates were also at the lowest that we had ever seen you know, since the, the start of the pandemic. Um, at around 1%. And you can see there's been this rapid increase in the percent positivity over the last two weeks. Just looking at this by province. Um, so the blue here is Gauteng. So you can see most of this has been driven um, by case increases in Gauteng. Um, but we have also seen increases in Limpopo, Northwest, um, and Mpumalanga. Um, in terms of the age groups, so we always, we, towards the end of the third wave, we saw quite um, uh, significant increases in our younger age groups. At this stage, a bit difficult to see in this graph. I'll show another one now. We can see that this has been driven um, mainly by our younger age groups. Um, and this is, is really a factor of uh, that the younger age groups are really those that are more likely to congregate, more likely um, to go out and socialize. And, and thus, similar to the second wave we saw last year, um, very much started in these younger age groups. So if you look at the, the percent positivity by age group, once again, you can see most of this is driven um, by the um, under 25 year olds, but we do get spread now to the other age groups. And so while the increased number of cases were initially found um, in several of the um, 
tertiary um, education centers um, in, in Shwane, you can see that we have now spread into the other age groups. In terms of um, sex, I think we have have had a very similar pattern between males and females, slightly increased incidence um, in each of the waves um, in, in terms of females, but this is cases and may just be that um, females are more likely to present to health services. But at the moment, very no significant differences between males and females. So just to focus on Gauteng province, because this is really where we have seen um, the, the, the increasing cases, very low case numbers mid-November. We were seen about less than 100 in terms of our seven-day moving average. And this has now crept up um, to about 1,500. So I think most of the, the increases in our daily case numbers at this stage are from Gauteng, making up about 80% of those cases. And very similar to our national picture, we can see really driven by the 10 to 14-year-olds 20 to 24 year olds, 15 to 19 year olds, and slightly in the 25 to 29 year olds. And I think really striking that, you know, at the beginning of November, we had very, very low positivity rates. Um, and so this, there has been this tremendous increase in the last um, 10 to 14 days. So I think I'm going to stop there and just hand over to, to one of my colleagues, um, just to update in terms of, of hospitalizations. Um, so this will be Dr. Jassat. Good morning, uh, to Honourable Minister and to colleagues and members of the media. I'm going to carry on from where Michelle stopped, uh, just to give you an update, particularly focusing on the Chuane resurgence that we're seeing uh, and giving you an uh, update on hospital admissions uh, over the last few weeks. So as you know, uh, DATCOP is a hospital surveillance system that was developed by NICD and the National Department of Health. And we currently have 408 public hospitals and 258 private hospitals that report uh, COVID-19 admissions to DATCOP daily. So when we look at admissions, the seven day moving average nationally, um, after the peak of the third wave, we saw a decrease to low numbers and we're starting to see a slight increase nationally. Uh, and what we see on the right is that the increase is uh, being uh, is evident in both the public and the private hospital sector. When you look at the, uh, the daily average of uh, admissions in the current 14 days and compared to the previous 14 days, we can see that there have been significant increases in Gauteng from 18 admissions a day to 49 admissions a day in the past two weeks and a small increase in admission uh, average in Northwest but the other provinces are still not yet showing increases in hospital admissions or deaths. Let's go to Gauteng now. Um, on the left, you can see the number of cases in uh, orange and the number of hospital admissions in gray across the three waves. And you can see the sharp increase in cases and admissions uh, now, uh, you know, since week 45. On the right, we track the percentage of cases that are admitted. And usually during the peaks of the waves, a lower proportion of cases are admitted because only the very sick get admitted. And, do, and after the waves, we tend to see a higher proportion of cases admitted. So currently we're still seeing a very low proportion of cases admitted. However, when you look at the week on week, week change, you can see the very steep rise in the week on week change in cases and similarly with admissions. And acknowledging that admissions always lag by a week or two after cases, uh, you can still see compared to the first three waves, a very sharp week on week increase uh, in Gauteng in this fourth wave. Looking at Gauteng's admissions, you can see in this resurgence an increase in both the public and the private sector. And on the right, you can see the number of admissions by district and you can see the earlier increase in, uh, in Chuane Metro. And then you can see the other districts starting to increase. Um, uh, thankfully, for now, we're not seeing any increases in deaths in either public or private sector and in any of the districts. And when you look again at the current 14-day daily average and the previous 14-day daily average, specifically for districts in Gauteng, you can see now that all districts have shown an increase in daily admissions uh, over that period. The biggest increase being in the city of Chuane and the other districts showing small but steady increases. Now on to Chuani Metro. In the last two weeks or so, we've had about 455 admissions uh, of 253 in public sector and 202 in the private sector. Eight people have died, 200 have been discharged alive and 219 are currently admitted. 
Uh, there's been a very sharp increase in admissions in a few hospitals with the highest uh, numbers of admissions, uh, particularly increasing in the last 10 days or so. In Chuani District Hospital, Steve Biko Academic Hospital, Jubilee, Medforum Private Hospital and Mamelodi Hospital. When you look at the numbers of admission per, um, by age, and this is one year age bands, you can see that what we normally see is a large number of admissions in older people. But in this early resurgence in Chuane, we're seeing most admissions in the zero to two year age group, a large number of admissions there. And we're seeing a large number of admissions in the middle ages, sort of around 28 to 38. But when you look at the incidence risk of admissions, where you uh, divide the number of admissions by the population size, you can see that the highest risk of admissions is still in the very oldest, the over 65s. And it's been increasing in all age groups over the last six weeks. This is the percentage of cases that are admitted by age group. And so you can see that uh, the, the percentage in the middle ages are quite low, less than 10% of uh, cases are being admitted but very high proportions of young children are being admitted. And of course, as we'd expect, higher proportions of older people are being admitted because they usually present with more severe disease and are at risk for more severe disease. Looking at the percentage of admissions that have comorbidities, as we would expect, you know, most of the older groups have uh, 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 comorbidities and are admitted with COVID-19. The number of, the percentage of younger children admitted with COVID-19 with comorbidities is quite low. This is the percentage of uh, admissions in Chuane with severe disease, and you can see that it's higher in the older groups. And in the younger groups, under 60, it hovers around 25 to 30%, which is what we've seen across the rest of the pandemic. Um, there's been very few deaths, just eight deaths thus far, but you can see most of the deaths have been in the older groups, uh, 60 to 69 and over 80. Now, this is the proportion of admissions that are severe in Chuani Metro. And as you can see that uh, during the peaks of the waves, we have a higher proportion of patients who are admitted who are severe. And after the waves, that decreases. Currently, the number, the proportion of patients who are admitted with severe disease are quite low and lower than what we've seen across the rest of the pandemic at about 60%. And just to zoom in on the last seven weeks, you can see we've had a sharp increase in the number of patients admitted with not severe disease compared to the number of patients admitted with severe disease. And just finally, this is very incomplete data, but I thought worth sharing. Uh, in all the admissions uh, in Gauteng, about 25% have known uh, vaccination status in DACOP, and you can see the vast majority of patients, new admissions and the current inpatients are unvaccinated people with a much smaller pro proportions of patients admitted being uh, fully or partially vaccinated. I thank you for your time. Um, let me just go through a quick summary. We've seen increased admissions in Chuane Metro, both in the public and the private sector. We are starting to see increases in other districts in Gauteng, in, in hospital admissions since, since the past week. There's a sharp week on week increase. And that's important to note because for surge preparedness, we know that uh, when the hospitals become overwhelmed very quickly, um, the, the, there's less capacity and there's more mortality. And so we really need to look at surge preparedness, uh, both in Chuane Metro, the other Gauteng districts, but also the other provinces. The, the increased admissions we're seeing in young children under two could be just precautionary. We don't have enough information yet, but the indications are not that they're more severe than they have been in the past. But I think what's important for us to note is that while we do uh, hospital surge preparedness, this time we may need to look at pediatric bed preparedness especially. Uh, it doesn't look at the moment as if there's any signal towards increased severity, but it is early. Admissions do lag by about two weeks after cases, and it takes some time for patients to have an outcome. So I think this is something we'll watch and hope to give more information in the coming weeks. And interesting also is that most admissions are in unvaccinated individuals. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks very much, uh, Dr. Wasila and Dr. Groom, Michelle Groom, uh, for that input as far as the uh, epidemiological report is uh, or update is concerned. On that note, I'm going to swap my uh, presenters instead of uh, getting the clinical observation from Dr. Unben Pile. I'm going to call upon uh, Dr. Hongwana from Houghton Health to give us uh, the state of readiness as far as uh, the province concerned in terms of facilities, oxygen, ICU, and the likes. 
So I'm going to hand over to Dr. Pumwana. Dr. Pumwana. Doc? Uh, I'm switching on my video. Okay, and just also adjust your camera so that the people can see you. You are live on TV, the camera TV are, but yes, now we can see you. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. And Dr. Mahali, I, I was going to send a, a, a presentation, but apparently it's not coming through and I'm not familiar with the, this, uh, with the system of, of Zoom, but I will, I will engage with, with everyone. We, we currently in Gauteng um, have 4,407 functional beds. Remember Gauteng Health has got 18,344 beds prior to COVID, but this uh, number of 4,407 were the beds that we had at the peak of the third wave. And we decided as Houting Health that we will take these resources to the fourth wave. It is from lessons learned. When we started with the third wave, we were at about 2000 beds and we have what we call a risk adjusted demand informed strategy. So as the peak of the third wave went up, we increased until we came up to 4407. We decided from the end of the third wave that we are going to continue to monitor these um, beds that we have been allocated to COVID-19, the 4407, and these will be our resources that we will take to the fourth wave. So we have been preparing for the fourth wave since the end of the third wave. Secondly, with security of oxygen, during the third wave, we had daily meetings with our frogs where we monitored uh, the bulk of oxygen tank, even during the riots, including the cylinders, the availability of the oxygen cylinders. And we noted during that period that the oxygen cylinders are strategic in us managing the pressures that is there in terms of patient, in terms of patient care. So we are currently having a meeting with our frogs on a bi-weekly basis. And when the fourth wave hits us, we will go back to our daily meetings. We also develop a WhatsApp where we daily monitor what is happening in the facility. So in terms of security of oxygen, we are, we, we can boldly say we are secured because that's exactly what we went through, through a third wave. And we've been monitoring that throughout. And do we intend to take the same strategy and approach for the fourth wave? In May, 2020, uh, Houding did not have specific COVID-19 posts. We had a staff complement of about 68,000. As we speak at the moment, we have a staff complement of 6,000 for the COVID-19 contracted personnel. And this contract ends at the 31st of March, 2022. And we have submitted to our principals that we need that this post continue for the financial year 22, 23, in terms of sustaining stability and also lessons learned. Um, we, we, we have a cohort that have currently is experienced in managing COVID-19. We, we, we're not dealing with variants with, uh, in terms of when patients come into our facilities, we're dealing with, with uh, individuals. Of course, the information we, we, we have received from Prof uh, Salim and all the other uh, experts in our country help us to actually have a an attitude that says we need to defeat uh, this COVID irrespective of the various variants that, that it presents with. Um, so we are prepared. So we have moved from 68,000 last year. Currently we've got a staff complement uh, of 81,000. Remember we are not the department of COVID-19, we are a department of health. We still have to deal with the other uh, healthcare needs of our population, of our communities. So we still need to uh, redress and address and manage whenever a patient presents in our facilities. We've got four academic hospitals. Uh, Charlotte, we're happy that it is functional, even though not to an extent that we desire due to the fire, but the expertise that are there are highly appreciated. Because remember the first patient in South Africa was managed in Charlotte, who was, uh, you know, diagnosed with COVID-19. So the expertise of Charlotte remain 
very, very critical for us as one of the four academic centers in, in Houting. We've got three tertiary hospitals and we've got a number of um, regional hospital and district hospital. Uh, we have about 30, 38 facilities in, in Houting and about plus minus 300 clinics that we have in Houting. So the, the, the attitude we also are maintaining since the um, decline of the third wave is to constantly monitor our PPE that we do with supply chain, the security of water, the security of a power supply, we're monitoring our generators, the security of waste management, the security of laundry services, the security of pharmaceutical supplies. So we are constantly monitoring those key issues because they are very important in making sure that our uh, experts, that is our staff in the forefront, in the trenches of fighting COVID-19, are well supported. We also are noting on a regular basis the issue of the psychosocial needs of our staff. Because when you have, you, when you have a war, you have to make sure that your soldiers are looked after very well. And if there is security of oxygen, there is security of PPEs, there is security of uh, power supply, security of water supply, that makes the, the, the battlefield more aligned to us winning over, over COVID. We cannot deny there are challenges. And the, the other issue that we have is we need to reassure our communities that we, we are ready for COVID-19, uh, fourth wave. It's like the cricket staff, uh, the cricket team of South Africa, the Proteus. If they're going to play England again, we cannot judge them in terms of their losses to England. We have to have confidence that they are going to uh, do their best with uh, playing cricket against England. We have played or battled and combated COVID-19 the first, second, third wave. We are ready to combat it for the fourth wave. It's lessons learned. We have a, a dashboard that we monitor our beds on a daily, on a daily basis. Uh, it is live. We check it every day. We are monitor we're monitoring also our ABTs uh, in Bronx Strait, in Josh Mukari, in Barra, in Anglo Ashanti, um, as to the occupation of those facilities. So we have bed capacity. We have a continuum of still employment, of uh, engagement with our uh, HR to make sure that we still fill up the 1,000 beds that are needed, um, uh, not, not 1,000 beds, the 1,000 posts that are still needed to enhance the battle and combat for COVID-19. We are collaborating with our expertise, public health specialists. We are collaborating with our emergency medical services. We are collaborating with academia. We take every note very serious. We're collaborating with our communication systems to make sure that information that is sent out in the community is information that is reliable uh, in order for us to mitigate against doubts, um, mistrust, and any aspersions that are thrown to us healthcare systems. Let us reassure, uh, our communities that we have very dedicated and very, very committed healthcare workers in our systems. People that are experienced and very committed. The 81,000 healthcare workers in the Department of Health are committed to face the fourth wave as we have faced the third wave, as we have faced the second wave, including the first wave, in the interest of making sure we, we win. Nobody will ever really tell us exactly how it's going to behave when it hits us, but we are prepared as we are ready to make sure that we respond. Our approach, uh, risk adjusted and demand informed strategy will still be implemented. In the concept of highly reliable organizations, you create redundancy, you create a common mindfulness and you create checklists, which we have at the moment and we are monitoring on a daily basis the admissions in our, in, our, in our hospitals. We are monitoring our 4407 dedicated COVID-19 beds in our hospital. We are accessing all the um, systems, um, your EVDS, your DATCOV, any system that has been presented uh, to leverage uh, the combat of COVID-19. Uh, these are resources that are available to us as the Department of Health in Houting. 
And one of the key issues in highly reliable organizations, you defer to experts. And we have got expertise in our academic hospitals, in our tertiary hospitals, in the regional hospitals. And we have the confidence that they will take a clinical decisions in order to increase this base from 4407 to a figure above 4407. It will be a risk uh, managed uh, approach, clinical risks, because what is key for us is that when a member of our population, a citizen of our country who is, who is not well, needing healthcare attention, when they come out of our hospital, the outcome should be better. We have to reduce morbidity, we have to reduce mortality, but we must present to ourselves, to yourselves, that we are, we are, we are ready. Um, President Nelson Mandela indicated that um, the brave do not necessarily are people who are not afraid, but they're people that will manage their fear. So we will manage our fear against the Omicron or any other variant. We will remain focused uh, as we face the third wave, the turbulence that the, the fourth wave is bringing, but we have the confidence as we have been able to collectively and collaboratively, collaboratively manage the third wave together with the resource that with the South African National Defense Force that was there, the Doctors Without Borders that were there, the WHO, uh, and all the, you know, the partners that have been available as resources for how to do better health will be deployed collectively, collaboratively to really combat uh, the, the fourth wave. So, um, honorable minister, um, honorable members and respectable colleagues, this is the, the synopsis of where we are as Houthi Department of Health. We are aware of the, the um, sort of a level of mistrust that, that exists in our communities, but we have gone through three waves and we are confident that we will go through the fourth wave and we will make appropriate decision in time for whatever you know, curveballs or deviations that the fourth wave will present. And we'll, we will respect and depend on science and depend on the resources that the Houghton Provincial Government has provided and the remarkable support we are receiving from the NICD, from the National Department of Health and all other partner departments that have been working with us to make sure that uh, the citizens of Houghton and the citizens of South Africa are well looked after when they come into the facilities in Houghton. We have been having uh, ad hoc collaborations with our private sector uh, colleagues in Houghton. We will sustain those collaborations and engagements. We learn from one another and we will continue to do that. But the last message that I have for um, my dear brothers and sisters in our communities is that let's not panic. I'm repeating what Prof. Uh, Abdul Salim said, let's not panic. Uh, yes, we are afraid, but we are going to manage our fears and remain focused, use science, the resource you have, knowledge to respond and combat the, 40, the, the, the fourth wave of the COVID-19. That was predicted prior that it might be taking place in December. If you are into it now, we will continue to monitor and, and take appropriate steps to respond. To, to, to COVID-19. We want our people to be safe and alive. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, uh, Dr. Fawana, for assuring us that as far as uh, the province is concerned, you are ready for, for any un, un eventuality. So without wasting any time, I'm going to call upon uh, our panelists who's going to give us uh, clinical observations uh, as far as uh, the patterns, the symptoms uh, as concerned. That's uh, Dr. Unben Pile. Somebody was asking me uh, through the WhatsApp. I'm, re I'm, I'm referring to Dr. Anban. So here is Unben, but uh, you can correct me if I uh, pronounce the, son, the name very well. Over to you, Doc. Thank you, Faustin. No, the pronunciation is perfect. It's Unben Pile. Um, Honorable Minister and Deputy Minister, good morning, and colleagues. Uh, I'm a general practitioner in private practice uh, in Gauteng. And from our side, you know, what we've seen is very similar to what the scientific um, panel have presented, is we've started seeing increases in cases uh, for around about 10 days now, with a very sharp increase. Uh, prior to the 19th, I think, you know, majority of general practitioners' cases were down to zero. Um, in, a, in the general practitioner space, um, the cases are very mild, 
but it is early days. So we've seen patients present with flu-like symptoms, dry cough, fever, uh, night sweats, and a lot of uh, general body pains and uh, malaise. Um, and I think this is in keeping with all the other COVID um, waves that we've seen. We haven't seen a vast and uh, a big increase in hospital cases or in pulmonary complications. But again, I think this is really early days for us as general practitioners. Uh, generally, um, the cases that we see in private practice are milder cases. Um, but, um, you know, as the waves in the hospitals fill up, you know, we start seeing a lot of the complications. I think the general practitioners are very um, aware of how to manage patients. We've been doing it now for three waves. Uh, we have done a lot of upskilling in the last few days as well for general practitioners so that we are aware on what needs to happen in terms of management and treatment with the FOT wave. But overall, I think our cases that we've seen is also uh, positive cases in both vaccinated and unvaccinated cases. I think the vaccinated patients definitely, we manage them at home uh, and we manage them symptomatically. They tend to do much better. And uh, we are at the moment um, starting to see this increase. And so we will know a lot more in terms of what the patient's presentation features are, or I think as we go along. Uh, thank you, um, Foster. Uh, for your very brief uh, presentation, Dr. Pile, now I'm going to call upon our colleague from the Department of International Relations and Cooperation, uh, Mr. Clayson Munyela, to share with us uh, as far as uh, international traveling is concerned and how the department is uh, assisting in that regard. Over to you, Mr. Munyela. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Foster. And uh, let me also acknowledge the Honorable Minister uh, and all the other experts uh, that are in the meeting. And uh, good morning to members of the Fourth Estate, as well as to South Africans who are following this uh, briefing uh, on television. Let me just start, uh, Minister, with uh, a case that we were dealing with uh, in Mauritius, because I think that's the most urgent one, uh, given the number of calls that we received from uh, families here at home, uh, inquiring about the plight of their loved ones. Um, so what happened is that uh, there is a plane that took off from South Africa um, to Mauritius uh, when it was uh, airborne uh, en route to Mauritius. I think a decision was taken by the authorities in Mauritius then um, to impose mandatory quarantine for South Africans. This was taken hours after the takeoff, uh, I guess taking a cue from European countries. Um, the update, however, with regards to the plight of South Africans in Mauritius uh, is that um, all of them have been processed. Um, the tourist groups, if you can call them that, have been sent to respective hotels uh, for purposes of quarantine. Uh, and the cost uh, of this uh, quarantine will be covered by the government of uh, Mauritius. Uh, resident permit, uh, permit holders uh, have been sent to uh, facilities uh, owned by government in, in Mauritius uh, for purposes of uh, quarantine. Uh, now, Minister, we've also just uh, been informed um, by the Republic of uh, Mauritius uh, that they've decided to apply further arrival restrictions uh, on flights arriving from South Africa with immediate effect. Um, so as of Sunday, the 28th of November, uh, and until further notice, there will be no incoming uh, passengers on flights connecting uh, from South Africa to Mauritius. Um, we think it's important for South Africans to know this, so that if you're planning to travel to Mauritius, uh, you may want to uh, look at uh, uh, other options. Um, We've also, uh, Minister, received uh, reports of uh, some South Africans stranded in other capitals uh, around the world. Um, now, we would like to urge uh, South Africans who may be uh, in similar circumstances to please uh, contact the nearest embassy uh, in the country where you may be 
there is a team, Merola embassies, uh, to assist South Africans who are stranded and render uh, the necessary consular uh, services. Those who are not able to perhaps get contact numbers of our embassies, uh, if you visit the DERCO website, we've listed all the contact numbers and emails of all the uh, embassies abroad. Uh, we've got quite an extensive footprint globally of over 124 uh, emissions. Uh, the alternative, if you still are unable to access that, would be to call the DERCO headquarters here in Pretoria. We've got a 24 hour operational center um, and the number there, if I can just say it here on this platform, is 012-351-1000. Uh, uh, you can call us around the clock. Uh, our consular services team is on standby to render the necessary consular services to South Africans who may require this. Let me just then uh, conclude, uh, Minister, by, by making this point that uh, uh, it's quite um, regrettable, uh, very unfortunate, uh, and I'll even say sad uh, to be talking about travel restrictions imposed by a fellow African country. I, I have since seen that there's about three other African countries that have also uh, taken this decision to impose travel restrictions on South Africa and other countries uh, in Southern Africa. Uh, the, uh, the minister and the scientists in this platform have already articulated why this decision um, is unwarranted and unjustified because it's not based on science. The president, His Excellency President Sir Ramaphosa also made this point uh, last night. Um, we, as the Department of International Relations and Cooperation, are engaging all the countries uh, that have taken this decision. Uh, Minister Naledi Pando is talking to her counterparts at the level of diplomats. We're also engaging all these countries with a view to uh, persuade them to reverse this decision. In the context of African countries, uh, I think the point must be made, Minister. Uh, uh, you and Minister Pando and the government pay me to uh, once in a while take off the diplomatic hat uh, uh, and communicate things that must be said. And after I've uh, you know, done the damage, you can then come in and say, no, 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 uh, this is just an official of government. As ministers say, uh, <laughs> we, we, we will say something different uh, to, to, to temper uh, the language. Because what I don't understand is that some of these African countries that are doing this um, know the struggles that as a continent we have, uh, where European countries will take this decision and impose these travel bans. Uh, and the immediate effect uh, in the context of South Africa, for example, is that you are then putting a hold on tourism. Now, the tourism, is, uh, tourism industry is a potential catalyst to the economic recovery that we seek to see in our country. Um, the UK, for example, remains uh, one of the largest sources of tourist arrivals in South Africa. So when the UK imposes a travel ban, it has that impact on our country. So when a fellow African country does this, uh, especially in the context where most of these countries are beneficiaries, uh, I mean, South Africa has just made a, a substantial donation uh, to donate uh, vaccines to, to a number of African countries. And I see in the list, uh, some of these countries who are imposing these travel bans on us are going to be benefiting from that. Uh, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, and that's why we think these decisions must be reversed immediately. Um, so uh, for our part, uh, Minister, I'm going to conclude by saying that we are engaging and we are hopeful that uh, given that we've got very solid and cordial relations with all these countries, uh, we, we consider them to be friends and partners. Uh, we believe the discussions will take place within the spirit of that cordial uh, nature of our relations, and uh, we should be able to resolve these matters. Uh, for South Africans, uh, please call us when you need assistance. We've got a team that's uh, on standby 24-7 to render the necessary consular services. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Miela, for, for that uh, presentation as far as traveling is concerned. Somebody was telling me that uh, South Africa was being punished for being honest. So we don't know what to do. If you're honest, you get punished, you keep quiet, you, 
don't you get punished. So on that note, uh, I'm going to open uh, questions and answer session. But before I do that, I'm sitting with a number of questions, almost uh, more than 15 questions. What we'll try to see how can how can I summarize them. But before I take the I read out the first uh, batch of questions, I'm going to check with Minister if he wants to make any other summary uh, based on the presentations by all the panelists. Minister. Uh, no, uh, uh, for start, uh, just to thank all the contributors. I think this has been uh, a very you know, useful engagement. We thank uh, the richness of the input from the first one from Prof Karim, uh, the clinicians, the epidemiologists from the NICD, uh, Dr. Pile, Dr. Hongwane, and, and also finally, uh, Mr. Munyela. I think this is information which we believe that uh, at this time of, of need, uh, all South Africans want to be assured that uh, we are on top of the situation and those who are in distress uh, have somewhere to can call. And I think this is quite, uh, quite appreciated to the contributors. Uh, we can deal with the questions. Thank you very much. Thanks, Minister and members of the panel. I'm going to take the first batch of questions, uh, which read as follows. The first question is from Catherine from Times Lives. It reads as follows. How many people who have tested positive for COVID-19 have been vaccinated? How many people who have tested positive for COVID-19 have been vaccinated? Number two, PCR tests have been abandoned worldwide from the 31st December 2022. What's going to be used then? Rapid antigen test. The second uh, question, or the third question from Tamakan Business Day. Uh, sorry, Foster, can you just repeat that one? It says uh, PCR will be abandoned from when? Uh, yes, according to, yeah, according to this journalist, uh, the PCR test will be abandoned from the 31st of uh, December 2022, which is almost uh, a year and a month from now. Uh, so she's asking if uh, we're going to start using the rapid antigen test in, in the absence of a PCR test. Tamakan from Business Day is asking, uh, many countries have introduced vaccine mandates for healthcare workers. Why has in South Africa done so? Is it not something that we plan to do in future? Patricia Visage from SABC is, wants to know, when exactly did we first become aware of this variant? What is the benchmark for the countries of Africa to be considered to have entered the fourth wave? What was the benchmark for entering other waves except the cause of the first wave? Lastly, from the same uh, journalist Patricia, compared to other waves, is there a concern that could be more severe wave than the third wave? If so, why not? Lastly, uh, can you talk us through the government's thinking on how the new variant was introduced? There's been a lot of criticism that we, hasn't, uh, we have not determined how transmissible or severe this variant was and the cause of travel bans. I think I can take this uh, batch of questions. I think they're more than enough for the panelists to respond. Then I'll take another batch. Uh, just repeat that last one. I, I'm not um, very... The last question, Richard, follows. Uh, can you talk us through the government's thinking on how the variant was announced? There's been a lot of criticism that we have not determined how transmissible or severe this variant was and the cause of the travel bans. bans. You want to say bans? So the cause of travel bans. I'm not sure if... Uh, you understand, Minister, and the members of the panel? Uh, okay, uh, I'm trying to just think. Um, okay, I, I hope yeah, she, she, to, she, she just wants to know, in, fact, in summary, she wants to know whether the way we introduced this, uh, we announced the variant, uh, we've been criticized for this. So are we happy with the way we announced it? Because now this was followed by a huge criticism from the international community. Uh, who have uh, some of them who have uh, uh, ended up uh, banning us uh, for travel as far as travel is concerned. 
Uh, I'm going okay. to stop here, then I will allow the members of the panel uh, to assist uh, each other to respond to this before I take the second batch of questions. Over to you, um, Minister. Yeah, th thank you very much, Foster. Uh, uh, Dr. Chris will help me in this, in terms of uh, who will be best to deal with what. I'll just, let me just say, in as far as the issue of mandates, including health workers, I think it's from Tamara Khan. As, as was announced by the president, the whole issue of mandates, um, the cabinet and, and on the recommendation of the Coronavirus Council has agreed that our net joints have, have formed a team which has been looking at this. Net joints is a committee made of heads of departments. Um, now they will that they've got a small team which is working specifically looking at the introduction of a formal introduction of mandates our approach as government thus far has been to say that we will not have mandates determined centrally by government but we will support any sector of business civil society institutions of learning any institution which uh, decides on on a mandate either for its staff or uh, customers or uh, clients or or you know if it's a, a learning institution staff and students and that um, we will support those who uh, take such a decision and that's why we developed the vaccine certificate which we have been uh, uh, improving its quality and reliability and security. So that's really, uh, there's been our approach, but at current, the, what the uh, uh, NCCC and cabinet have, have decided is that the net joints must come with concrete proposals on how to face in mandates. Look at what kind of uh, areas of uh, activity, uh, it be in the social activity, business and so on, uh, what are the so that include workplaces so the team will make will come with firm proposals which will include also health work uh, workplaces so that, 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 that that's what i can say about that one um in terms of how do you determine when when you are in a particular wave uh, uh, dr crisp i'm sure together with colleagues from the nicd uh, will assist us there's a scientific way in which we look at the positivity, uh, the constant in the, in the seven day, 14 days, where it is constantly, um, and, and, and they will be able to talk to that. Um, the question of the criticism about how the announcement was made, we were guided by the fact that we are part and parcel of, of the world community under the United Nations, under the World Health Organization. There are particular you know, conventions in terms of uh, international health regulations, which bind all member countries, that when you, uh, in your country, you discover something which, you know, is a threat to life, not only to your citizens, but also possibly to other uh, citizens of the world, whether it's Ebola in uh, West Africa, um, whether it's a, a, an outbreak of uh, typhoid, um, or any other uh, disease, um, all this, in, especially infectious diseases, we are obliged in terms of, you know, uh, international health regulations to, to report so that, you know, uh, 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 the WHO for, uh, as a leader in, in, in terms of health in the world can alert member states and, and the citizens of the world that this and this is happening and we can take necessary precautions. So we did exactly that. Um, now, uh, of course, we know that there are many South Africans who are feeling that maybe we're too much in a hurry to uh, announce uh, the, the fact that this has been discovered. And because if we had kept quiet, possibly the travel bans would not have happened. But that would have been very detrimental uh, because uh, you don't want our approach is not to have our citizens live in false security and false safety. Uh, and, you know, like some of the world leaders have, have, have taken that kind of route. So that that's really remains our approach 
uh, until a, a different decision can be taken. Um, can I uh, invite Dr. Chris maybe just to help me to see uh, the other uh, uh, scientific and uh, health uh, epidemiology matters? Uh, Thank you, Minister. Okay, over to you. So, Thank you, Minister, so, and good morning to everybody. I suggest that we ask Wasila and Michelle from NICD to talk about how many tests uh, who have tested positive are not vaccinated. There was a slide shown, and we are able to monitor this uh, over different time periods, but they can talk about what we are seeing at the moment and maybe expand on what has already been shown on the slide. Um, NICD can also respond on the PCR and what we... We use different PCRs in South Africa, and they can talk about why and what with the PCR going forward. Um, the question about whether we are seeing more severe disease, and if we're not, why not? We don't know. And I mean, I think that is what the clinician said. At the moment, it may partly be due to the fact that uh, a larger proportion of the population is vaccinated now than in any other of our three waves. So we did expect that it doesn't matter which variant we'd have, there'd be some protection from the vaccination, but also protection from the wild uh, infection that we have seen during those three waves. But I'm sure the colleagues from the NICD can expand on that as well. How a variant is introduced? Well, that's also speculative because as we heard from Prof uh, Karim, viruses mutate all the time. So whether this virus actually mutated here or elsewhere and found its way here, with one person is entirely speculative. It's a very difficult and long exercise, as you will have gathered from the initial investigations in China to try and establish exactly how a virus mutates and becomes uh, aggressive or starts to be transmitted in a community. Again, they may want to respond to that. When did we become aware? Uh, the labs phoned me on the 24th of November. Now, we had all been watching the increase in numbers for two weeks. And what happens is the labs, when we see a change in the numbers, all become alerted to see what the variant is and how the tests are behaving. And so on the 24th was the first time that our laboratories were able to definitively show that what they were already picking up uh, had a particular gene pattern. And that gene pattern was notified to us on the 24th. And on the morning of that was the evening of the 24th. And on the 25th, we were able to convey all that information in a meeting with a couple of government ministers, including the health minister, and then later in the day to the president. So we knew on the 24th and government knew on the 25th. Um, the question of the fourth wave is, uh, is rather academic, and I'm happy if the NICD colleagues would like to go into that. But I think we can, we've been discussing with them yesterday and overnight about when do we actually say that we've entered the fourth wave. Technically, there's a definition, as the minister said, where you count numbers and moving averages and a number of other issues. Um, but I think we can safely say we will head into the fourth wave. So it's, it's purely academic about whether Gauteng is actually already there or not there. It's a question of time. And this is what we expected would happen round about now. But with your permission, Minister, I think if I can hand over to Michelle and Wasila, they will be able to answer the other questions. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Crisp. And um... So just, uh, I think, to, to speak to the vaccination status. So um, the NICD holds the, the case data. The hospitalization data is um, within the DATCOF system. Um, and so we are um, linking in the EVDS data, which is collected by the National Department of Health in terms of being able to um, classify vaccination status. And so going forward, we would be looking to integrate that information into our daily reports. Um, Dr. Jasat can and give a little bit more details just in terms of the hospitalization data. Um, just to comment on the fourth wave, I think um, the previous three waves, we have definitely, you know, there's been a lot of you know, emphasis in the public domain in terms of these classifications of the waves and whether we're in a wave or not. And as the, Dr. Chris has highlighted, I think the technicalities are really, you know, um, we should not harp on those in terms of these, these definitions of exactly when 
which exact date the wave is. We've seen an increase in the number of cases in Gauteng for all intents and purposes. Gauteng is entering, has entered the fourth wave. We're seeing high positivity rates. This is most likely going to extend um, to the other provinces. And I think we need to, in terms of our plans for, um, for um, dealing with the resurgence, um, whether we're in a wave or not, is not going to affect those. And in terms of the public, I think we need to be vigilant in terms of, of the non-pharmaceutical interventions, the mask wearing, um, paying attention to social distancing and voiding large gatherings um, as, you know, at, at any stage of, of seeing increasing number of cases. And, and it should only be when we're technically in, in a fourth wave. Um, I think I'm going to hand over to Dr. Anne von Gottberg just to um, please just expand on uh, the PCR testing and I think can also just give a little bit more information in terms of that initial detection of the variants. Thank you, Prof. von Gottberg. Thanks, thanks, Michelle, and um, good morning to um, all on um, at this press conference. Um, so I'm, I'm, I've written down um, three questions that I could tease out that I could answer or have some information about. I think the approval in 2021 that is being withdrawn by the CDC is simply the withdrawal of the emergency use um, approval. They want formal, full approvals that are for all other PCR reagents. Remember in the pandemic earlier, early in 2020, things were happening very, very quickly. And in order to get um, registration of PCR tests, there was so-called emergency use um, authorization. And the FDA and throughout the world, people are saying we have many commercial tests. There's no need for emergency use. And many of these commercial tests are all fully authorized now um, at SAPRA and FDA and other um, international organizations. So that's the the 31 um, December um, deadline. Um, I don't, um, there's a, uh, is a screening of travelers um, uh, failing us, the PCR screening. And um, I don't believe this is the case. I think the force of infection, the number of individuals that might be infected in South Africa is quite um, high. We saw that increase, the numbers increasing so quickly. And I think um, they were incubating. So I'm hoping these are still all the tests and laboratories um, that we are doing routinely. We know that they all work. Even if there is this one drop out, we would still call them positive. And so what is happening is there are individuals who are incubating and they are negative three to four days later. Remember, they were tested as they arrived and they had a 72 hour um, frisk from the previous um, test. So more than likely, this is what's happening. It's simply a reflection um, of the force of infection here in South Africa in Gauteng, the very province that many of these travelers must be living in. Um, and we need to explore exactly what other reasons there might be for that high number um, of individuals that tested positive. But I don't believe it's um, a failure of our laboratories to detect um, the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, in addition, there was something about um, Botswana did independently identify one of these sequences and they loaded it onto the global web page, uh, web um, database that's called Gizade. Because it was only one or two, I'm not sure, it was still small numbers and it was quite unusual with the many mutations. They didn't um, notify, we, they don't have to notify us in South Africa and they didn't, in fact, they knew that they had found this, um, it had been loaded, but it did need additional sequences to, for us to really think, oh my goodness, something is happening. So if a day or two later, South Africans loaded their um, sequences, so we loaded from the NICD and from AGSA the sequences, and it's the information together that was independently um, detected and loaded onto Gizeh that then made us all talk together, Botswana and South Africa, the scientists, we were speaking together and then this information also helped because the numbers were greater from South Africa. We really, and we were seeing this increase. So there was the epidemiological data that made us report to the government here in South Africa and then subsequently report globally. I think those are the questions that I could see that I could assist with, over. Thanks. Uh, I'll try and uh, respond to a few questions uh, relating to the hospital data. Um, as Dr. Groom uh, shared, we have some uh, data on vaccination status in uh, DAC of the hospital surveillance. And just looking at the Chwane increase amongst the patients where we do have information on admissions, 13% were vaccinated or, or partially vaccinated and 87% of admissions were unvaccinated. 
Um, also, we've been tracking this over the past few months since February, and what we can see across the country is that there's a much higher risk of death amongst those that are unvaccinated. Um, but of course, as we get a better linkage of our case and hospital data with the EBDS, we'll be able to share this uh, going forward. Um, there were a few questions about how many admissions were related to the new Omicron variant. So we are currently busy with linking the hospital data to PCR data, because there is a signal on the PCR that indicates which ones are the variant and which ones aren't. And so once we do that and we do the linkage, we'll be able to compare variant versus non-variant and, and their outcomes and severity. And hopefully soon we'll be able to report more on uh, what proportion of admissions are related to the variant and how, which, uh, you know, whether there's more severe disease related to the variant. Um, there was also some questions around pediatric admissions increasing. So I just want to emphasize that, you know, we vaccinate to protect us as individuals from severe disease and death, but we also vaccinate to protect those around us, particularly those who can't vaccinate. And given that children under 12 can't vaccinate because they're not eligible, and we're seeing, uh, we saw in the third wave as well, a shift towards more admissions in children. We're seeing slightly more admissions at the start of this resurgence in children as well. Um, it, it's, it, you know, we're not uh, sure if it's related to the variant circulating and a higher transmissibility. We're not sure if it's because of the immunity gap with more older people already vaccinated and so younger people being a bit more susceptible. But what we do know is that uh, vaccination of the adults around the children will likely protect the children from spread as well. Um, and then finally, I wanted to make a comment. Uh, there was a question around preparedness at the community level. And uh, we, the, the NICD and the National Department of Health and CHI did an audit of mortality in hospitals with high mortality in the second and third wave. And one of the things we found that the patients that died uh, in the hospitals were those that were presenting very late. They were already quite sick and they were dying within the first day or second day of being admitted. And so I think it's very important, you're quite right to point out that it's not just hospital preparedness, but we need to look at community preparedness, preparedness of the GPs and the primary health care clinics so that they can monitor and refer early those patients who are at high risk, the older patients with severe comorbidities, and also get the message out there to people not to delay presenting to hospital if they have severe disease. Um, and, and so, yeah, I think a, a very important issue raised around not just preparing hospital capacity, but preparing uh, for management of patients in the community. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, uh, our panelists, for responding to those uh, questions. Uh, now I'm going to take uh, the second batch of questions, uh, looking at the time. Uh, the second batch of questions reads as follows. Brian Sukutu from Citizens is asking if there's no scientific basis for the travel ban. Could the decision by the Western countries be informed by politics or racism? How hopeful are we to reverse this travel ban? We know this are political, but the uh, minister and the deputy minister can uh, assist on, in this regard. Andrew Meldren from Associated Press uh, is saying, what are the key areas where vaccine mandates will be most effective? The third question, how many of those who have tested positive have been vaccinated? I think this one has been uh, touched on. Charlotte uh, Kiwan from EWN, what do you think the chances are for those countries or nations that have imposed bans reversing their decisions on us? Have the, gov uh, have the nations or the government already engaged uh, with these uh, countries who have uh, imposed the travel ban on this. I know uh, Mr. Miela has touched on this, but they can also uh, assist in this regard. Another question from Sophia from AFP, President Ramaphosa and Dr. Karim have both said the variant was first described in Botswana. Could you please explain what does it mean and clarify the timeline that led to the announcement of this uh, on the 25th of November? Kawala Makuleko from UFM is asking if vaccination campaign messages by the department uh, or the vaccination campaign messages by the department refers to the fourth wave that is approaching. What evidence does the government have as far as the fourth wave, which is uh, anticipated that will be coming anytime soon? Is there no evidence? If there's no evidence, 
how far or how is that not fear mongering by the government or oh, by your own admission the government there's no enough information on how the new variant will manifest itself why 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 is government using to tell the, its vaccination campaign in the process of creating an impression that taking a jab will protect one against the COVID-19 and all its manifestation, including this new variant. Another question from Wendell Roof is uh, directed to Dr. Yassad uh, or anybody who can respond. Did I hear correctly uh, that there's been no death from this new variant yet? I know I've seen on the chat that uh, the colleagues uh, from NRCD have tried to respond to this, but for the benefit of these journalists and others who are watching through other channels of uh, uh, communications, can they assist to respond if, they, if there's any death which has resulted from this uh, variant so far? Christian Duplosis, I'm going to take this as the last uh, batch of questions. I mean, the second batch. Christian Duplosis from News24 is asking, is, is there increased hospitalizations in those uh, between zero and two due to this uh, variant? I want to check if there's any increase uh, with hospitalizations for children between zero and two due to this uh, variant. And should the parents be concerned if there's such? How many people have, have been hospitalized or died during uh, due to this uh, virus Omicron so far? The last uh, question from the same journalist uh, so far, what are the most common clinical symptoms reported on this uh, variant? And these symptoms, have they less, are they severe or less as compared to the other variant, the Delta? Lastly, when will the booster shots be made available in public and how which age uh, groups will be receiving these booster shots? I'm going to hand over to the panelists. Uh, if there's any questions, uh, question which I did not, uh, uh, read it well, feel free to let me know so that I can be able to repeat it. I'm going to hand over to Minister and members of the panel uh, once more to respond to the second batch of questions. Uh, will be, in fact, yeah, this is the last. The other one, if there is, maybe should be the matter of follow-up questions that I see uh, on the chat. But for now, I'm going to hand over to Minister and members of the public, I mean, of panel to assist uh, in response to these uh, questions. Over to you, Minister. Well, thank you very much, Foster. Uh, unfortunately, I think we will need to make this the last because we still have other matters to attend to for the day. So I think, yeah, we'll, we'll try and deal with this. And then uh, uh, in terms of, uh, I, I think Mr. Minyala could come back, uh, but uh, the question from Brian, and then I think there was another one on, along the same lines as to whether the, uh, about the, the motivation for this ban, travel bans and whether there's a chance that they can be lifted and whether we are engaging. I think really we, we, we leave that to uh, the motive. We can only leave to the, those who made those decisions. Um, but uh, our own suspicion is that it's an attempt to try and, uh, you know, give a false sense of uh, security from uh, this pandemic uh, to the citizens of those countries by thinking in a very simplistic way that if you have closed airports uh, from, for people from particular countries, it's like this virus, you know, it's, it's kept in, in some container in those countries and carried by the uh, citizens of those countries. So if you stop them, uh, then nothing will happen. Uh, but we know that as uh, many uh, uh, scientists and, and uh, I mean, have said that uh, the, by the time you, this is, re is revealed, we, from experience uh, uh, by this time, we know that it is, by that time, you know, the, the virus is already all over. But also, as we can see, even after this announcement, uh, as, as it has happened before, uh, positive tests of the same variant are being uh, discovered in, in various. So we will continue to engage. Um, and as I've mentioned, even yesterday, I had that engagement with the Secretary for Health of the US. And uh, as uh, Mr. Munyala has indicated, Minister Pando is also engaging uh, counterparts from all those countries and other countries. 
so we'll, we'll, we'll continue to engage to try and show them the senselessness of this particular action. And uh, because we didn't uh, close ourselves out of the world, they did so. We will really just hope that sense will prevail and sooner rather than later, they will see, you know, uh, the, the, the uh, wastefulness or, or uh, you know, a lack of sense of, of what they've, they've done. Um, so I'll just pick up on, there was one um, uh, on, um, there was somebody who said that we have, uh, by our own admission, that there's not enough information we are, why are we using the variant to uh, uh, somehow um, to campaign for for vaccination? Well, the, the 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 issue of the rise in infections, whether it's which variant or that which variant, whichever variant, the fact of the matter is that as the as the infection rates rise, it it's just a reminder to us that this virus. It remains deadly, remains in our midst. And it, uh, all that we are doing is to motivate our citizens that um, you should, you know, utilize what is available, tried and tested in terms of uh, 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 prevention of serious illness by being vaccinated. Uh, it's not in any way uh, 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 trying to scare people it's just a, a reminder that we do have the tools which can save our lives. And, and those tools are tried and tested and, and the and all, you know, the fear around the variant should not actually drive us into despair because we do have tools, um, non-pharmaceutical, the, uh, the health prevention measures, but also we do have a, a, a medical, a biomedical a, a tool to help us to avoid if we do get uh, the virus to have a milder illness and possibly not even get the illness. Uh, but if we do get a, a milder illness and not end up in hospital, so it's not in any way taking advantage, but it's essentially uh, making people aware that there is a way in which we could protect ourselves. Um, yeah, uh, let, let me, let me, uh, as I'm looking for, I think the others, can I just uh, call Dr. Crisp again? And there might be an area where you might be able to also uh, invite, uh, find a way where um, in some of the areas, I think on the, on uh, there was a repeat, although it had been explained by the team from NICT about the virus founding in Botswana and so on. And, and I thought uh, Prof. Tulio could also uh, say something just to add to the NICD, but let, let me leave it with uh, Dr. Chris just to see which other, as, as, as we want to conclude, uh, which other questions can be taken by who. Uh, over to you, Dr. Chris. Thank you, Minister. So I'll answer the ones that I feel comfortable to answer and then I'll pass on the others to others. Um, the question of uh, deaths due to the Omicron, I think was already explained that uh, we are still typing and getting an indication of which of the diseases are caused by Omicron, but uh, that can be repeated by uh, Wasila in a moment. Um, the percentage of vaccinated people who test positive, I saw there was a correction of the question. So we've got 16 and a half million people vaccinated in South Africa. So that's over 24 million doses have been administered to people. And it's a very small number of those people who have been diagnosed positive, literally very, very small. So to correlate back and say of the, all those vaccinated who's test positive, I'm sure we'll be able to do it with time, but uh, it's, it's minute in comparison with the unvaccinated people. Um, the key areas where mandates might be effective. So I think people misunderstand the mandate story. So at the moment, uh, we, we in South Africa have mandated non-smoking in South Africa. So when I was a younger person, anybody could smoke anywhere, any place, anytime. In the movies, in the airplanes, in motor cars, houses, shops, anywhere, in the, while they're doing their grocery shopping. We now have mandates that says you may not smoke in those places. We didn't say you may not smoke. We said you may not smoke in those places. 
So you still have a choice to be a smoker, but you have to comply with where you may and may not smoke. You can't smoke in the workplace, for instance. So I think that uh, people need to understand it perhaps in that context, that uh, when we get this uh, working group to finally make recommendations, which we hope to work very hard on this week, uh, that's the kind of thing we expect. In such environments, you will be required to prove you are vaccinated. Otherwise, you can't enter that environment. We're not saying you have to go and get vaccinated. You might just have to stay at home and not do certain things. Um, the question of hospitalizations of under twos and so on, perhaps Unbin, who's a GP and uh, the colleagues from NICD can respond to that. We, uh, and, and about the symptoms that are being seen at the moment, because they're the ones seeing the patients on a day-to-day -day basis. I can respond about the boosters. Um, we are expecting a definitive recommendation from the Ministerial Advisory Committee on vaccinations on further rollout of boosters. So at the moment, the department is vaccinating healthcare workers who participated in the uh, Sasonki study with Johnson & Johnson vaccines. So that's what we call a homologous boost. And we are um, awaiting the outcome, perhaps even this week, of an application by Pfizer for, to the, the regulator, SAPRA, for the approval of use of the Pfizer vaccine for a boost. At that time, we should get an indication of what they are saying about it. But we anticipate that it won't be a problem for us to roll out uh, in the same way that we did with the age categories with older people first with getting those boosters. But that we will know by the end of the week. Um, and it's likely we will start with older people first for the boosters because they got their vaccination uh, more than six months ago. So if I can hand over, I think uh, colleagues from the NICD, I'm not sure who would like to tackle the, the first responses there, thanks. Wasila. Thanks, Dr. Chris. Um, so maybe I should just explain it more clearly that in the DATCOV hospital surveillance, we collect information on all the COVID-19 admissions. However, we don't do genomic typing uh, on every patient that's diagnosed. So we don't know which, whether they have Delta variant or Omicron variant. Uh, but what we are trying to do is because on the PCR test, there's a signal that you can pick up on patients who have the new variant. Um, we, we can actually assign uh, that signal to all the hospital admissions and the ones that don't have the signal don't have the variant. The ones that do have the signal do have the variant. So we're working on that, that this week and we're hoping to share that quite quickly. Um, so I'm not yet able to share with how many deaths have been from the new variant, whether the children admitted have been with the new variant. I think that's something that hopefully in the, during the next few days, we'd be able to share more information on. Uh, but you know, regarding the question about pediatric admissions and should you be concerned, um, we don't yet know if the admissions in children were precautionary or if they are more severe than they were before. Uh, but we do know that uh, COVID-19 in children is usually mild, but we do have a few children who die, uh, or we have had a few children who die, particularly those with underlying medical conditions like cancers and TB and HIV, and also the very young children under one year. And so I think we should be cautious with children, uh, uh, you know, as we should be with, with, with everyone, you know, and, and to adopt the measures that we know to prevent transmission, uh, including avoiding gatherings, and uh, you know, keeping distance, staying outdoors, wearing masks, and of course, vaccination. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Crisp, did you allocate any other person? Yeah, I thought maybe, thank you, Minister. I thought maybe uh, Unbin would like to talk about the symptoms that they are seeing. He did mention it in the presentation, so if he's still with us. Uh, Unbin, yeah, are yes, you? Sir. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Chris. Yeah, so I think, um, as mentioned in the present earlier, that um, majority of the cases that we've seen, so as general practitioners, you know, we don't know what the variant is. And the clinical picture is pretty much the same as in the previous waves. So we've seen a lot of patients presenting with the flu-like symptoms, uh, dry cough, fever, body pains, um, even night sweats. Um, we're not seeing a lot of patients presenting with decompensation at the moment. Um, but I'd like to say, obviously, this is still early days. In terms of the pediatric patients that we see, I think we do tend to be a bit more cautious with uh, pediatric patients. 
And that also means that, you know, we would refer patients a bit earlier uh, for uh, specialist care or maybe hospitalization, especially in the younger under one year olds. But the adults we are managing at home and with milder symptoms. Thank you, Dr. Kus. Okay, thanks very much. Minister, I think that's all the questions that were asked to have covered. Thank you. Uh, back to Foster, I think we have dealt with uh, all the questions. Uh, uh, I'm just worried that uh, I don't know if Tulio is still there. We would have liked to get some comment uh, whether I know the colleagues from NICD dealt with, but uh, just in terms of the, the link between uh, the announcement in Botswana and their own finding, if you could also add if he's still there, but if he's not there, yeah. Yeah, Minister is not there. They had to go to a meeting, both he and Richard. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't send you a message. Oh, okay. No, but they, I think the matter was dealt with by um, by the team from from the NICT. So uh, possibly uh, we we can say that uh, uh, that's fine. I think I think we need to wrap up and maybe uh, uh, Foster, you can get uh, Dr. Lomo to come in. Thanks very, uh, thanks very much, Minister and members of uh, the panel uh, once more. Uh, I think we've covered, uh, we've responded to almost 95% of all the questions. The rest of the questions, we'll deal with them outside uh, the formal media briefing as usual. So on that note, without wasting any time, I'm going to hand over to, to the Deputy Minister of Health, Dr. Swinson Jomo, to summarize these discussions and so that we close. Over to you, uh, Doc. Yeah, no, thank you very much, Foster. I'm sure it's just that you like to hear my voice. Uh, but yes, I could actually start by thanking the minister for really bringing such an eminent team of scientists to assist us. Uh, for me, it was more of a learning experience. And uh, it is really assisting me, minister, because uh, we are still going to go out there with you being asked some of these questions. And maybe uh, I was writing these questions and the answers, and uh, I'll also be able to uh, answer them in Zulu and uh, in Sikhosa sometimes, but uh, this was mainly another language here that we used. The, the whole message from the minister and the team were just emphasizing the president's speech to say Asikomeni. This Asikomeni is a, is a song by Blake, the Smith Black Mambazo, also encouraging South Africans to vaccinate. Uh, but uh, minister, I would really love to just emphasize on the two points. One was the a question by Hao uh, Hello from UFM, who was saying maybe isn't it that we are maybe as a government having a fear mongering approach when you talk about the fourth wave? <clears throat> it's to remind Hao Hello that uh, in fact in the presentation of Professor Abdul Karim Slim, he did mention that when he appeared uh, before Judge Mosaneke Commission, he mentioned that there will be a possibility of a fourth wave, and he did not mention the date and time. So. We as government are always supported by scientists. And when we then started talking about the fourth wave, it was also based on that uh, statement that him and other scientists have always advised us about. But the last one, uh, 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 Minister, and to the team is that um, the, the, the speech of the president yesterday, there's something that is asked by Mr. Brian Sokut. The president it went on to say this travel ban or prohibition is not justified scientifically. Now, the, the president did not go as strong as Moniela is going through. <laughs> uh, the president remained very diplomatic on the matter. But um, uh, if you listen to the AU co-chair, uh, and uh, that video has been playing in many of our national radio stations, where she had a BBC interview, uh, Dr. Alakija. Uh, she mentioned a very emotional part there where she's mentioning a statement that, uh, in fact, Botswana, Botswana wanted to buy vaccines and uh, somehow was pushed at the back of the queue by those who, have, who are rich. So you are now accusing Botswana for not vaccinating enough, and yet it wanted to vaccinate. We celebrate in the country, we wish you can do more, as the president was saying, we have vaccinated over 25 million, uh, we have 25 million vaccines used. We wish you could have done more and we will continue to do more. But in Africa, generally, the vaccine uh, rate is very low and not because they don't want, it's just because those who have money are jumping the queue and are ahead of all of us. So we wish that uh, Moniela and through your 
participation, you'll be able to persuade these countries who are actually uh, putting a travel ban on uh, us because they are actually dealing with bringing a, bringing a big dent on the economy of the country and on just cordiality of the country. Thanks very much, Minister, for what you have done to us. And uh, I'm actually ready now to talk about this matter in Zulu and English because uh, you are still going to get more South Africans who are asking about this thing. Thank you very much, Minister. And thanks, Mr. Foster, back to you. Thanks very much, uh, Dr. Tlomo, our Honorable Deputy Minister. Before, as usual, before I do the final uh, closing, I'm going to request the minister to give us that last uh, party shot, minister. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I just need to thank everybody, Deputy Minister, uh, Dr. Crisp. Uh, and as we conclude, let me just, uh, 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 in front of uh, the participants here, just to thank uh, Dr. Crisp, who has been holding the fort for the last two and a half months as the acting head. Um, we did get a message uh, yesterday through a matter affecting the, the DG, Dr. Butelezi, which was handled under the presidency, that this matter has been uh, resolved and that he, should, he will be coming back. So uh, I want to take this opportunity to thank uh, Dr. Crisp for having held the fort under very difficult circumstances. We'll still be with him. Uh, continuing in his uh, other uh, 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 um, in, 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 in his other uh, roles as the DDG in the department, but uh, uh, and supporting uh, the DG going forward. So thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Crisp. But thanks to all the panelists. Uh, indeed, I think it's very valuable, and I'm sure the members of the public have uh, gained a lot from this interaction. Uh, no further ado, thank you very much, Foster. I'm sure you can uh, close. Thank you. Indeed, uh, let me also uh, thank uh, the members of uh, the panel for responding on a short notice, uh, as usual, together with our my key stakeholders and uh, members of the media for always being there for us, giving us opportunity to clarify certain issues that need to be clarified and also communicate the message. I want to assure the members of the public that as much as we do not answer all questions 100%, we are always available to respond to this question through media queries, through media interviews. Uh, we'll try to uh, deploy as many uh, messengers as possible. So on that note, I'm going to take this opportunity to officially adjourn this uh, media briefing, but the communication will continue outside this uh, formal media briefing. Thank you. Thanks, thanks Foster.